Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number 5, Ontological Engineering for Smarter Knowledge Graphs. In this excursion, number 7, we are going to talk about the semantic web rule language. So we bring rules into the semantic web. We have already spoken about rules in general in the previous lecture and you see here we are on the level above the information exchange level and that's on the same level like the models level but rules of course are working a bit differently. You remember rules usually bring the world of the closed world assumption into the open world assumption of the semantic web technology stack. Okay, let's start and for better visibility I will switch on my laser pointer and we start with a semantic web rule language, Swirl. Swirl is based on a combination of parts of OWL, so the web ontology language, and rule ML, which is the same as datalog. So the basic idea is that datalog rules apply on OWL ontologies. And the symbols in the rules can be OWL identifiers or new datalog identifiers. So Swirl is already around for a while, so in 2004 there was a W3C submission and that still exists and of course it can be used in practical application as we will see for example in the Prodigy ontology editor. There are two variants of syntax that can be distinguished, so there is a XML concrete syntax and there is an RDF concrete syntax and abstract syntax. In Swirl Rules are represented as implication of an antecedent, so that's the body, we know that already, and the consequent, that's the head. In general, the point is, of course, if you combine OWL together with rules, in end effect, it's undecidable. However, we can still live and work with it, and I will show you how this works. So again, our rules consist of a body, which is the antecedent, and the consequent. And both of them are conjunctions of assertions, of atoms, we know this already, of the following form. So either they are here a class expression, C of X, or they are a property description, property that is applied on X and Y. And X and Y are variables, OWL individuals or elements of a so-called OWL concrete domain. And uh, we can also say that these two elements might be the same, so we have the same as expression. And we can also tell that these two things are different from each other, so different X and Y. That's the very basics that we have, so let's have a look at the rules again. So they are often also here expressed in the way that I've already shown you in the last lecture, that the head here is at the beginning and this here would be then the body and you see here A is head, B is body and then as well knowledge base K uh, consists of sigma which is an owl knowledge base and P which is a finite set of rules. And now if you want to define the atoms, so here's the syntax for the atoms either, it's a class expression that is of course then applied on a variable or an individual identifier uh, you have, can have here also a data type expression that is then um, applied on a data type variable or value identifier. And this here then R is an object property that is applied on two variables. Or you have here also a data type property and uh, you have here variable and here data type. Then there is a special thing which is called built-in function. So there are several built-in functions that for example can do arithmetics or other stuff that you might uh, need in your rules and of course then for the same as and different from you have here uh, i equals j or i doesn't equal j. So that's more or less the syntax that you need for constructing these kind of rules but of course these rules then will be expressed or serialized in an XML based or RDF based variant. OWLDL and datalog they are applying mostly the same interpretations. Of course, we have to find or also define an interpretation for these rules to make clear how they should be computed on the computer. So it's rather easy to look at the components that come from OWL. So we have the OWL individuals, and they are nothing else but datalog constants. And then we have OWL classes that are unary datalog predicates, and we have OWL properties. So they are then binary datalog properties. So the interpretation can be modeled for OWL ontology as well as for data log rules. And entailment of both of them for that combination is still possible. 
So let's have a closer look at the swirl semantics. Of course, we have to define an interpretation. And here, the interpretation consists of an object interpretation domain together with a data type interpretation domain and two interpretation functions, one for the object interpretation and the other one for the data type interpretation. And of course, both of these domains, object interpretation domain and data type interpretation domain, they are disjunctive. So they have no element, of course, in common. Furthermore, we have vix, the object variables that are mapped to the object interpretation domain, and we have vdx, the data type variables, which are mapped to the data type interpretation domain. So if we now look at the interpretation, it's quite easy. So if you have the class expression c of i, this means that i is a member of c, of the interpretation of c, of course. Then if you have uh, a property that connects i with j, then of course i and j are element of exactly this interpretation of this property, which is kind of a relation. And the same also holds here for data type properties or here a data type. Special case are the built-in functions. Of course, you ca cannot tell everything about what kind of function is your built-in. However, you have usually here um, kind of a predicate and then you have here um, variables that are connected with each other. Here for um, the identity of two variables, i is the same as j. Of course, then the interpretation of i is the same as the interpretation of j and the same then holds in the other way around for the difference. So if i is not the same that as j, then this holds also for the interpretations. Now let's have a look how it works if we process the rule. So if a swirl antecedent is satisfied, no, a swirl antecedent is satisfied if and only if either the antecedent, so that's the body, it's empty, so this is trivial because from an empty body you can in the end deduce everything and uh, all atoms or all atoms of the antecedents are satisfied. Then, of course, antecedent, so the body is then satisfied. The consequence, so the hat, is satisfied if and only if it is not empty, so it's not zero, and the atom of the consequent is also satisfied. So overall, we can then state a rule is satisfied for a specific interpretation i if and only if the interpretation i, which satisfies the antecedent, also satisfies the consequent. Then the entire rule, of course, is satisfied. And this is what we are usually looking for. Okay, let's have a quick example. How would that look? So we have here a simple rule which states, okay, what is an uncle? So if x has parent y and y has a brother z, then x has uncle z. So this is a very simple relation and if you try to model this then in swirl and this is here the XML variant of swirl you see here we have here an implication the rule here we called it somehow uncle it has an annotation so this is the uncle rule and then here starts the body of the rule and we have here individual atoms so you have first have has parent and of course we have here the variables X and Y and here we have the property has brother, we have here the variables y and z, and then comes already the hat down here, and this is then has uncle, and this connects variable x and z with each other. So there is no additional, let's say, operator between here these two atoms because, as we have learned, this is a specific uh, rule where all the constituents, all of the atoms in the body in the antecedent are connected via conjunction. Okay, it's as easy as that and if you are dealing then with a um, protege, it's even more easier to um, denote and to express these swirl rules there. And the reasoners mostly are able also to cover swirl too. Yeah, however, it's a nice thing, so logical inference for owl and swirl together in the end is undecidable. What does that mean? That means that there is no known algorithm that is really able to entail all possible inferences for all swirl knowledge bases, even with an unlimited uh, number of resources and time. 
However, we are living in a practical world, in the real world, and there, of course, there are situations when it, when it works, so no problem. So algorithms are able to entail all possible inferences for some swirl knowledge bases. That's clearly possible. And the other way around also, that algorithms are able to entail some inferences, but for all swirl knowledge bases is also possible. And simply therefore, it's possible to work with swirl in a practical way. You should be aware that there are situations when it's not going to work and when exactly these undecidable or undecidability conditions will strike. So that might be possible. Okay, so there are many tools. So you see here in the first line, these are specific reasoners that are able to process these swirl rules. And then for protege, for example, you have also several add-ons that you can use. So for example, the swirl tab that you then see also here that you can use here in um, protege. So here is, for example, the uh, visualization of the uncle rule and we have here defined a person and here we have a rule and um, in the end it should be the outcome what is an uncle and you can play around with it and can assign here uh, variables with names and then see what's going to happen. Okay, so far so good. We, have no, we are now done with rules. In the next chapter of the lecture we will show you how to design your own ontology.